artist says in the context of the meanings of his works, I don't think there is ever someone who gets it. I don't get it particularly. And further calls himself more a fabricator than a sculptor, using new materials each time. Wood, steel, cardboard, ceramics, rubber, chrome, leather, marble, corrugated iron, polycarbonate, clay, vinyl. You can be sure of at least one thing, to be led astray beyond the clouds. Let's not be stupid. You may have to twist and shout, add and subtract, hunt for the missing part and wonder, how much does your mind weigh? Struck dumb? Well, this is just a prelude. These were all the titles of some of Deacon's exhibitions and works. Deacon reminds one of the Telugu poet Srinivas, who asserts, I always liked the song that defied total comprehension. Where there is scope for imagination, I made a habit of rebirth again and again. Which is what Deacon does, pushing the boundaries each time, each time beginning anew, creating something quite different from what he made before. Recipient of the prestigious Turner Prize, the Robert Jacobson Prize, honored with the French Ministry's Order of Arts and Letters, awarded an honorary doctorate by Leicester University and made an, uh, a CBE by the British, Richard Deacon showed early interest in art. He studied at Somerset College of Art, Taunton, then graduated from St. Martin's School of Art and did his masters at the Royal College of Art, London. By the 80s, he had become a familiar name on the international scene with his inclusion in important group exhibitions at the Tate, ICA, Hayward and Serpentine Galleries in London, the Central and South American tour of Transformations, New British Sculpture and the Museum of Modern Art, New York. A landmark exhibition, A Quiet Revolution, British Sculpture since 1965, toured across prestigious museums of the US from Chicago to San Francisco, California, Washington DC and Buffalo. This was followed by tours of South American museums and significant shows in Spain, Germany, France, Finland and Switzerland. The turn of the century took him to the Venice, to the Venice Biennale in 2007, the Glasgow International in 2006 and the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2012 among others. A major retrospective of his work was held at the Tate Gallery last year. It is but natural for artists of the caliber of Richard Deacon to be urged to impart some instruction about their art to aspiring young students. So since 1977, he has been on the visiting faculty at renowned art schools in Amsterdam and Paris, and since 2009, a professor at Dusseldorf Kunst Academy. Known to be a sculptor who does extraordinary things with extraordinary things, Deacon hopes that in the process people get pleasure from his work. Much like the poet Srinivas, he too seems to declare, I will embrace only the sun. The Chandigarh Lalit Kala Academy and art lovers of Chandigarh are honoured by your presence here. Sir. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Academy, to uh, D1, and to everyone involved for inviting me here. Particularly this man. This is Jeet when I first, after Jeet Danjal, when I first met him in uh, 1983, uh, 31 years ago. Um, in this photograph, he seems puzzled about the inability of a right angle to come together. Uh, but the, uh, um, uh, at the time we were both doing residency in the uh, Margam Sculpture Park in Wales. And, uh, 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 and it wasn't just the uh, problems of right angles that, uh, that engaged us, but the uh, problem of living and working in the freezing cold of uh, um, South Wales. Um, and it's been a pleasure to follow his work uh, for me to follow his work since then 
and been a, um, I'm honored to be invited by him to be here to celebrate both this occasion uh, and his uh, uh, honorific birthday. Congratulations, Jeet, and thank you. <coughs> For my talk tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the, uh, uh, the exhibition I made at the Tate last year uh, as a way of talking about the, um, uh, the, work, uh, the progress of the work over the years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then, uh, if I can go fast enough, uh, I've got a second presentation of a current project which I'm working on in, uh, uh, in Ladakh, uh, here in India, so that uh, um, uh, I thought that uh, would be interesting just to describe a work that's in process rather than work that's uh, um, uh, finished and uh, already done. So as a, um, in uh, uh, this time last year, I made a... Uh, uh, presentation at the Tate Gallery Britain, which was a survey of work that, I, uh, that I've made since uh, 1977. It's kind of a fairly extensive survey. Uh, it occupied six rooms, uh, and the rooms were divided up into sort of, uh, into groups. So we, I tried to, we tried to make each room a kind of coherent little exhibition on its own, uh, and following through various themes and strands in the work. Um, so walk, uh, the, uh, and the exhibition was organized uh, in a kind of L-shaped set of rooms. So uh, 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 walking into the first room, this is, uh, uh, this is what you saw. There, are, uh, there were three works in the room, uh, three sculptures in the room, and a group of drawings. Uh, the three sculptures you see in this, uh, uh, in this view, looking backwards to the entrance to the room. Uh, two of the sculptures were made uh, prior to the drawings, and the third sculpture was made uh, after the drawings. Um, the, this was the earliest, this was the earliest uh, work in the show, uh, and uh, that was the second one, and this, is, and this galvanized steel one. Uh, was the uh, was made in 1980, um, and the um, all three of these pieces of sculpture shared a uh, um, uh, a kind of process uh, in that they started out with a, s a particular size of material, a particular uh, shape of material, which was then kind of folded up uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, gradually uh, both reduced and made into a volume. So this, uh, this started as a, uh, uh, a, flat, uh, uh, a flat disc on the floor. Uh, this started as a, uh, a s large square of wood. Uh, and this started as a, uh, sheets of galvanized steel as big as the floor of the studio, uh, which were then uh, rolled up. Uh, and the uh, the intention at the time had been to, uh, uh, the way that I was working, had been to try and make the material a p uh, somehow a part of the work and uh, um, to uh, um, let the procedures that were involved in structuring it uh, become both visible and uh, uh, direct, uh, direct the process. And there was also... Um, a, dis a kind of decision, uh, a bit like Richard was saying last night, I mean, I had the same kind of set of influences with uh, American somewhat minimal sculptors, that the, uh, uh, each, the, the material was, remained constant. Uh, uh, I didn't add to it, or uh, uh, obviously occasionally some bits dropped off, but the... Uh, uh, the, once this decision was made, the, uh, um, the, uh, the forming process uh, um, gave, uh, gave, the, uh, uh, gave, the work its, uh, gave the work its shape. Uh, and now and we're, we're looking at photographs here. Uh, and there was also, but there was also a considerable concern on my, uh, in my mind with uh, three-dimensionality, so that... Uh, uh, where you stood in relationship in relationship to the work, uh, the work changed dramatically. So that uh, I mean, it's clear with this uh, galvanized steel one that uh, 
the shape changes very radically as you move around it, so that the, um, as a spectator, uh, you're, uh, um, uh, you were kind of uh, involved in kind of reinterpreting the work as you, as you moved around it. Now, um, in the same room uh, were a group of drawings which were made uh, uh, sort of in between in 1978-79 when I was in the United States. And the drawings were made from a similar uh, attitude uh, in that the drawings started, on a, uh, started out with a geometrical figure drawn on a piece of paper and then continually modified uh, until I ended up with a kind of with a, um, uh, a shape that I, a shape that I liked or uh, something that interested me and there was a um, th there was a uh, uh, um, th there is a relationship between these drawings and the sculptures that I've made that I made subsequently though at the time uh, I wasn't trying to make drawings for sculpture or drawings of sculpture. I was trying to make drawings instead of sculpture. Uh, but clearly, if you, look at, uh, uh, if you look at this drawing and then you look at uh, um, this, uh, uh, this sculpture here, there's a, kind of re there's a kind of formal relationship. And the, uh, 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 the thing that kind of interested me and that uh, um, uh, supported me was that the, the, the drawings... Uh, sustained a, a, an outline without having any, although there was all this construction evidence around it, um, uh, that the, it was purely the outline uh, which um, generated the form and generated uh, uh, a kind of ambiguity. So these, uh, in a way, these drawings formed a, um, a sort of uh, alphabet or a vocabulary of the kinds of forms that I would... Uh, uh, that I would go on to use, um, and uh, uh, some were uh, more complicated than others. Uh, some uh, uh, the materials got a bit got a bit complicated. This was the last. This was one of the later ones, where uh, erasure uh, has also become a kind of subject within the uh, within the drawing. Uh, and it's quite a big drawing. It's uh, uh, not. Uh, it's not the same size as the projected image, but it's not far off it. It's, uh, um, uh, and each, um, there, are, there were nine of these drawings, and there were uh, certain relationships uh, um, pre interested me, the in between the inside and the outside, between the kinds of ambiguity, uh, and also some sort of um, um, relationships between the kinds of shape that I was drawing and uh, their ability to look like other things. I thought resemblance started to be a, uh, an, important, uh, an important issue, where, whereas up to that time I'd been a kind of fairly hardline abstract sculptor. I began to realize that association uh, and uh, the kinds of uh, um, connotations of image uh, could become uh, important. So that the, uh, these drawings kind of freighted in um, ideas about perception, ideas about uh, uh, parts of the body, ideas about the relationship between the, the, uh, the body parts and those uh, 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 and the ways in which you experience the world. Uh, this was the uh, uh, the last of them, and then when you move into the uh, then when we moved into the second into the second room, again you can see a kind of relationship between uh, uh, this drawing and the kinds of work. Uh, uh, which followed, which were uh, uh, mostly um, uh, ma made in uh, laminated wood uh, with a very linear structure and again built up a bit like the drawings, uh, one on top of the other, but beginning to uh, talk quite uh, extensively about the kinds of uh, um, uh, relationship between the spectator, uh, the way in which the spec the uh, 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 the, the kinds of interpretation you had uh, of the shapes you saw, their eyes, ears, noses, mouths, um, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the empty volume within, uh, within the work, which, which also became, for me, a kind of uh, um, uh, a source or a kind of uh, um, uh, conveyor of meaning. 
uh, and the, uh, the very fact of the way in which they're made. These, were, uh, these are kind of made by laying um, thin strips of wood on top of each other and, glue, uh, and gluing them together. The glue starts to talk a lot about uh, uh, the pressure um, and, uh, uh, and kind of time in a funny sort of way um, in that it's laid down one on top of the other. Uh, so this room, this is the second room of the show, so this room is kind of full of the, was full of these, uh, oh, full, had three of these uh, uh, um, laminated objects in it, uh, and uh, uh, very much kind of uh, to do with linearity and uh, um, a certain kind of absence of, uh, uh, of physical volume, uh, but presence of uh, delineated volume. Um, and these works uh, were also starting to have uh, uh, titles. Um, so in the beginning they were untitled. This was an untitled work. Uh, and, now, and now we're starting to, have starting to use titles. And titling became uh, a sort of secondary way of working with the work uh, in that I was, the title uh, um, alluded to or uh, things that I was thinking about or uh, led you in wrong directions or also... Uh, because I'd been for a long time preoccupied by the way in which uh, language itself is a kind of operation on the world, that the, the, the way you talk about things um, reflects the way things are, uh, physically, the way, we th the way we think and the way we talk uh, and the way we perceive have uh, this kind of very um, tight relationship with each other. Um, and and uh, language isn't something that's separate from the world, but which is... Uh, part of it. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is, this one is titled Tall Tree in the Ear, which is taken from a, um, a line in a poem by the German poet Rainer Maria, Rainer Maria Rilke from his sonnets to Orpheus. And that Orpheus story uh, with, um, where Orpheus charms the animals and causes the rocks and the stones to move uh, by the power of his voice uh, had uh, uh, was a uh, story that occupied me a lot, as well as uh, a more abstract idea like resonance, so that uh, uh, um, the idea that speech uh, is, a res is a resonating activity uh, that in the listener um, that is accommodated in the listener, so that resonance is a connection between speaker and listener, uh, uh, which implies volume, and that so that. All seem to all seem to work together, uh, and this one, uh, which was in the same room, but this is in the original installation, uh, was called "Blind, Deaf, and Dumb," uh, and was uh, a work which was uh, very physically present in, present in the room that it was originally shown in, which was at the Serpentine Gallery in London. But the gallery itself was kind of uh, uh, was blanked off. These windows were uh, uh, so the windows were. Uh, um, made opaque you could, uh, um, or translucent rather than transparent uh, and the light uh, I increased the light from the outside so the, uh, the, the room was very brightly lit from outside but you couldn't uh, uh, so the physical presence of the sculpture was very emphatic but there was no sense of the view beyond the, win view beyond the window so that sense of uh, uh, blind, deaf and dumb as being a kind of enclosure uh, uh, within the head, which created a world, was part of um, uh, was part of it. Uh, <coughs> the uh, I'd continued to make work in uh, in other materials apart from laminated wood, uh, and as the eighties progressed, um, those that. Uh, involvement began became more so, so that moving into the third room, um, the sculptures there were uh, uh, again they 're all they 're all kind of made they 're all uh, they 're all produced by a, uh, an activity of folding and bending um, uh, from flat pieces um, or or strips. Uh, a volume, so that the, the volume is created, uh, is made by, that, by, by all of that activity. Uh, this, uh, this one is uh, made from aluminium sheet and each, 
uh, and each bend has been made in the, uh, in the studio, uh, and at each, ju each junction, it was, uh, uh, the only pre-made pre unit is the screws that join it together. Uh, everything else is, is, has been formed. Um, uh, and the, uh, uh, the one in the back, uh, this one, struck dumb, already alluded to in the list of titles, uh, was, ma is made from, uh, was made in Glasgow with a group of sh steel workers in Glasgow uh, who I'd got interested in. Um, and uh, uh, they made it from a model that, I, the, that I'd supplied uh, by forming and bending steel plates. So there's nothing, actually, there's actually nothing inside the work. It's, uh, uh, the steel plate is, uh, is heated and bent uh, to form those uh, uh, shapes. So the, uh, um, uh, and this, this one, which is a, a second view of the, the aluminium one, uh, rests, is the work's called Mammoth, and you can perhaps probably see why when you, uh, in relationship to these kind of tusk-like uh, um, um, projections, but also to do with the, uh, it was also called Mammoth, to do with the fact that it, uh, stands on one f on, on one point, so it's, it was the, or, the biggest object that I could think of making uh, that that 's just stood in one place and then uh, next to it is a is a rather more complex work with a uh, a set of uh, um, is a sheath with aluminium on the inside and then a uh, a uh, laminated uh, um, Hardboard or masonite on the uh, in the second layer, on, and on the uh, um, on the outside, um, in these uh, pockets, uh, cut into set into the wood, are a set of vinyl pictures, uh, wooden vinyl representations of wood, uh, and the this the idea of uh, resemblance or representation had become a kind of con conversational thing, uh, and this was the last laminated work that I made. Uh, and by then, the, this sort of combination of uh, glue and wood had become so uh, uh, kind of rich for me. I thought it was sort of generating, uh, generating imagery or gener generating content. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the film. Uh, um, I'm going to forget the title of the film. <laughs> um, the... Um, a Solaris, it, uh, uh, and Richard Cox mentioned uh, mentioned films, but uh, uh, I'm a f I like science fiction films. Uh, and uh, uh, in Solaris, this, the surface of the planet starts to generate images that uh, uh, the astronaut in the space station uh, conjures images on its surface that come from the the head of the astronaut in the f orbiting space station. So at one point, the the surface of the planet clears and there's a Russian, uh, uh, a Russian farmhouse on, uh, just uh, uh, visible on the surface. So somewhat in that way that the, the material itself could start to kind of generate uh, imagery. I thought that the, uh, I used these vinyl fittings, as vinyl inserts, uh, as a, uh, a way of kind of suggesting that the material has a kind of richness to it that is more than its practicality, that it's a... Um, um, <coughs> um, that, it, that it can uh, be that it can be many many kinds of thing. Uh, so struck dumb, uh, a heavy sort of armadillo like uh, uh, like structure, which has um, this. Uh, uh, sorry, it has this cut, cut off front, uh, and but there's no access to the inside. Although it has uh, underneath it, it had a space that uh, uh, was like a second volume. So this was a uh, a kind of work that was um, uh, that almost that was and it was called struck dumb because of the way in which it looked like it had um, uh, something across its mouth, uh, obscuring its. Uh, uh, as if it was a bell that couldn't ring. Uh, the last work in the room was on the wall, uh, and uh, uh, again used a uh, um, a galvanised 
uh, galvanized metal with an insert, but in this case, uh, a vinyl pattern of leaves on it. So the, uh, uh, which talked across the room to the, uh, to the vinyl inserts in, uh, in lock here. So that uh, there is, there was within the room, as you can see from this, uh, uh, from this image, uh, a considerable concentration of, uh, uh, of material energy and uh, of uh, 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 possibilities generated from uh, uh, certain ways of structuring things certain kind and combinations of material. So we've been through three rooms and we come to the corner room. Uh, and in the corner room, it was rather different because we'd sort of been following a chronology. And in the corner room, uh, the... Uh, uh, I had a cluster of, uh, uh, of smaller works which, are, uh, uh, which were very materially diverse. Um, clay, uh, nylon sacking, vinyl, cardboard, leather and marble, um, polycarbonate, brass and, uh, bra brass and suede, uh, all of which were sort of uh, uh, indifferently w and high up on the wall a, uh, a kind of melted plastic. So all, uh, and they were all, all exploring different ways of fabricating uh, uh, with different materials and uh, a kind of conversation between uh, 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 within themselves about the, uh, their interior and exterior. Um, there was often a two, there's often a two-part uh, structure to them. To talk about this one since it's nearest me. Uh, this uh, uh, very fleshy leather uh, is kind of, kind of bound in with a, uh, a piece that's cut from a piece of fan marble. Uh, uh, and there, there's some sense in which the, uh, uh, it's, it's either trapped or uh, 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 pinned down by that, uh, by that. But then there's also a sense in which this uh, uh, material itself and the way it's, uh, the way it's cut uh, uh, refers to a, to a whole history of usage of marble and this kind of uh, uh, and the ribbing here, uh, which is just uh, an accident of the production in that they were it was a sheet that I drilled out, uh, uh, but has connotations of uh, uh, the fluting on uh, on Greek columns. Uh, and then the uh, uh, in these in this group the materials were much more kind of. Uh, uh, much more fluid. The, the one at the top was obviously the uh, a result of a kind of melting process. Uh, this is a result of a heating and uh, uh, bending, uh, bending process and then the things are drilled uh, and then this cardboard one uh, is, held, is stiffened by a, uh, a liquid resin which starts liquid and then goes, uh, and then goes hard. Uh, and here uh, there, uh, this is made from uh, uh, individuals, individual pots, individual pieces of ceramic, uh, joined together to form one single continuous ribbon. Uh, and uh, um, if this is as long a ribbon of ceramic as I could make, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is a vegetable sack from uh, nylon, woven nylon, and the, uh, um, uh, it's somewhat a bit like an inverted leg uh, uh, with, his foot, with the foot sticking up in the air. But the, uh, the, in both cases, uh, there is a kind of fragility involved that uh, uh, any kind of imp improper movement to this will cause the, will cause the, thing, to, uh, will cause the thing to break. If you pick it up, uh, if you don't pick it up at all points, then the, the thing will break. If this, uh, uh, unless you uh, put this down uh, uh, very precisely in the, and don't crease it, uh, it will kind of slowly fall over. So the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the material is at, uh, at a kind of, uh, at a point of delicacy, uh, and, that, uh, and that kind of delicacy um, uh, both adds, adds to the Specifics the, the, uh, and uh, uh, emphasizes its uh, uh, its presence here uh, here and now. All the works in this group uh, uh, were called, with, with the exception of uh, uh, with the exception of this one, 
were title, have a group title. They're all called Art for Other People. Um, and the reason for the title um, was that uh, when I started the, the, the making these smaller works in the, uh, late, in the early 80s, um, uh, I thought of them as kind of things that I could send out into the world that didn't need me, that, that they, they could exist uh, uh, in, sort of in a variety of situations and uh, uh, a variety of places. Uh, and, I, um, and I thought of them as that, that they, 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 they were like sending messages, and so that in that sense uh, that, that I was sending messages, they were art for other people. However, uh, if you look at something that's called art for other people, it, you look at it and you think, well, if it's art for other people, is it art for me? Um, so it, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense in which the title, my, the simplicity of my title kind of rebounds on myself uh, and uh, poses the question, uh, leaves, you, leaves you with a question, uh, if it, is that this is maybe art for other people, but it, uh, it's up to you to decide whether it's art for yourself. Um, so going round the corner, uh, we went into a, uh, a longer room, which has daylight for the first time in this show, which had three works in it, two ceramic works uh, and this uh, uh, large-scale uh, wooden work from the, uh, from, uh, the end of the 90s. Uh, and the ceramic works are from the beginning, from 2001, 2002. Um, and I'd started working quite seriously in ceramics in, uh, uh, at the end of the, uh, end of the 90s, and it became a, an increasingly present part of my, uh, uh, of my working process. Uh, and up to this point, most of the work you've seen um, was uh, 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 made, made within the studio with very little drawing, very little, there are some pre-planning, uh, and in the case of Struck Down, one model. But otherwise, mostly the works are made uh, without, uh, without modeling, without prior modeling. Whereas uh, starting to work in ceramics, um, I started to work on much more of a kind of uh, uh, a process where I'd make a model and somebody else would make, the, uh, would make a, a version of that model. And then we'd kind of work together on producing the finished, finished surface. Um, and. Uh, uh, and it became a very, it, and it's become a very rich, I mean, that's how it started. It's kind of developed in, uh, in um, quite complex directions, and not as simple as um, me making models and somebody else making it. But the, in the beginning, that's how it, was, that, that's how it started. It's become a very rich um, uh, process. And, uh, uh, and it took me a while to kind of work out really uh, what it was that was interesting to me about this. Uh, uh, apart from the um, ability to to make com the, to produce works of complex shape, but one thing that's clear is that uh, um, uh, the majority of the other work uh, is in some senses reversible. Uh, they're kind of fabrications, uh, and uh, you can um, you can sort of see how they they can be undone, whereas uh, the ceramic works are monolithic. Uh, and the, although they're built, uh, there's a, a very strong connection between the way they're built and the way that other things are built. Uh, they then go through this firing process and they become one thing. Uh, and, and, that, um, uh, and that's irreversible. So they, they go through a kind of irreversible uh, procedure. Uh, and the second thing that, that introduces is that um, a lot, a, a, not this one so much, but the, like this is an example, and you'll see some others later. Uh, the ceramics are now quite highly colored, and that, uh, and that coloring allows you to, uh, uh, and that introduction of color has allowed me to go into a, uh, um, uh, a larger field. Um, uh, the, <coughs> uh, uh, the wooden work is made by uh, not laminating is made by uh, steaming and bending wood, um, and the uh, the cage-like structure is made by uh, uh, repeated um, uh, a repeated activity of producing the same kind of thing. Uh, and what you have is this uh, um, uh, very muscular uh, um, curved curved structure, which is, these are all the same curve, or all uh, uh, differently aligned together, joined by a 
uh, a very rigid uh, stainless steel fence uh, that runs down the middle. Uh, and uh, it's, the, it's the tension between that muscularity and the thinness of the, uh, of the fence, uh, which, uh, which is the, really what the, work's, what the work's about. That the, uh, there's, a, there's a sense of it being both uh, um, uh, alive and dead at the same time. That the, um, so <coughs> and it, uh, it's called after. Uh, and the reason it's called after uh, is because uh, uh, it relates to a painting of Poussin's uh, in which there's a figure with this, uh, uh, in the foreground which, is, which has this huge serp, huge python over it. Uh, and it's that, uh, um, and it, it, there's a, the rigidity of the figure and the uh, uh, muscularity of the, of the snake, of the python, uh, uh, that kind of combination of uh, uh, f f uh, curve and straight um, uh, introduces, um, I think, a, a whole conversation about the relationship between, for example, living and uh, the living and the dead. Um, and in the same way, the uh, but at the same point, you could say that this was this was light, you know, reflects light. Uh, and this is kind of mass and, and heavy, so that the, uh, there's also a conversation about volume and thinness and light. <coughs> In the final room, uh, the wooden works becomes uh, uh, even more kind of elaborated, uh, although the, it's departed from that sort of repetition uh, and returned to a much more intuitive way of building. Uh, out of order, uh, the work here, uh, was made in was made progressively over a period of about three years, um, uh, where sections were made uh, until I realised that actually the whole thing linked together, uh, and uh, uh, it, sta it started by an interest in this uh, in this twisted element, the, uh, and uh, uh, and that twisted element as being kind of uh, fecund, as being producing. Uh, other kinds of imagery out of it, other kinds of shapes out of it, um, and you know, like like a lot of, and this uh, and this sculpture also satisfied for me a uh, sense of of Wenke sculpture, which did have an outline, but which the outline didn't describe anything. But the uh, um, uh, uh, and it was and the volume, uh, and it did enclose a volume, but the volume was ambiguous. The volume was full of. Uh, um, uh, it was full of points of entry. <coughs> the, second, the second and third sculptures in this room were uh, this ceramic uh, work down here and hanging ceramic work uh, uh, on the wall there, uh, which were both parts of the works I showed in Venice. In, uh, uh, th sorry, the one on the wall was part of the work I showed in Venice, and the one on the floor, uh, here's, a, here's the installation in Venice. Uh, uh, where the, in, in Venice the room had uh, uh, came, the room that I used had, was studded with nails um, because the original wall covering had been stripped off uh, and uh, so all of the works that I put in the show used nails, used those nails to take them off the floor. None of the sculpture touched the floor. Um, and, uh, at this, and I'd also been in relationship to the idea of doing a show in Venice, uh, I've been exploring colour as, um, as a surface on the, on the ceramic. So that the, uh, and, this, uh, and this work uses a very rich combination of glazed colours. Uh, um, and the, uh, uh, but the, most of the sculpture, it's, most of the volume of the sculpture itself has been cut away to uh, uh, produce the, um, to, to leave those kind of outline uh, um, uh, leave those outlines in a not dissimilar way from the uh, way in which in this uh, steelwork the, uh, um, the outlines have uh, uh, been described uh, it's a set of hollow poly, uh, of, uh, polygons uh, joined together so both of, the, both of these works use, um, rely on a kind of carving process uh, 
uh, at a very early, at an early stage, although the carving is, is, in, is in relationship to model making rather than in relationship to the actual thing, uh, but uh, an evacuation of the solid, whereas the very first works I showed, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the volume was created by kind of wrapping around it, either by kind of a sort of folding up or kind of, in the case of the laminates, uh, uh, wrapping around it uh, with the pieces of wood uh, n the, in these sort of more recent ones, uh, the, uh, the volume is kind of extracted uh, and what, you, what you're left with is a sort of shell of the, of the volume. There are, uh, there are reasons for that uh, and the reasons for that uh, in part have to do, funnily enough, with a visit to India in uh, 2003 uh, when I went to, the, uh, to Ellora. Um, and in particular to the Kailash temple in Ellora, which, as you will know, uh, is uh, a carved building. Uh, it starts out as a uh, huge piece of rock, uh, and the, uh, it ends up with the temple to Vishnu. And I thought this is the most amazing way to mark, make architecture, uh, and the most inspiring, uh, uh, and a revelation to me, that carving wasn't a question of, um, going around a solid, but was a question. Carving was also uh, a process of extraction, of kind of uh, evacuating from the inside and leaving a structure on the outside. So leaving, leaving the rooms and in the public space at the sort of, uh, so the the rooms are L-shaped. So you come, you come down, uh, uh, you've gone round an L, um, and then the the entry is uh, uh, is here. Uh, I had one work outside, uh, this large-scale ceramic work, which acted as a, um, uh, a kind of point of return. It existed in the public space, uh, but it re both referred to that last work uh, that I showed in the, uh, uh, the last steel piece, but it also seems to refer back to the very early uh, wooden piece in the, in the first room. Uh, so in... Um, I mean, one of the problems of doing a retrospective exhibition is you, go, you tell a story. You start at the beginning and the end at the end. And then when you, as an artist, when you finish, when you end at the end, you think, well, you know, <laughs> where do I go from here? You know, it's, it's over for me. Uh, so um, making, a, making it a circle uh, seems to, seem to kind of enable uh, uh, lots, seem to enable uh, there to be a future, to enable other things to happen. Uh, I'm, this is a... Uh, I'm working in Ladakh uh, on a, um, a s uh, s at a school that's at Shea, just outside Lay. Um, uh, this is the plan of the uh, the school buildings. The, s uh, the school is being built by Arabs, uh, and has been. They started it in uh, 2000. Uh, I was there in 2004, uh, and was there again last year. In uh, and the, uh, the building, the school is initiated in response to a problem of uh, 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 Ladakhi children having to travel too far to go to school uh, and, uh, uh, and, them not, uh, and them not having somewhere to stay when they're, uh, when they're sort of after a two-day journey to get to school, uh, they're not being adequate places to stay. So this is a boarding school for uh, initially primary but, also, but now secondary children. Uh, and next year will be uh, the first group of children that have been through the school uh, from the beginning of the primary to the graduation uh, uh, at uh, uh, 17 or 18. Um, the, uh, and the, uh, the buildings in the school are built um, on a, uh, according to this kind of mandala uh, principle, uh, with a, uh, and they're all built uh, to very low, to very uh, low energy requirements. Uh, they're uh, uh, solar, solar powered as far as possible. That uh, uh, the the heating they are heated, but the heating comes hot water comes from uh, uh, solar water heating. Uh, the the toilets are uh, um, uh, dry toilets, uh, etc. So the um, uh, the, the, the school is, uh, is also supposed to be uh, in an environment like Ladakh 
uh, which has a, uh, a very beautiful natural environment, is supposed to be uh, um, not to put uh, an extensive strain on the uh, uh, on the on the environment. And it, it's been uh, it's the Rinpoche uh, and the monastery at the top. Uh, the, the, uh, 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 it's the Rinpoche who gave the land, and the, uh, so that uh, um, some of the, the ground pl uh, putting the ground plan in a kind of mandala shape uh, is in part a consequence of that origin. And uh, um, I'm, no, I'm not a Buddhist, but the, you know I've been fo I was helpful to the school at the uh, in the beginning because I was interested in their um, in their program and in the. Uh, in, the, in why they were, in what they were doing, uh, and have followed their development. So I was invited back last year uh, with some, with the idea that I could possibly, that you know, uh, I might contribute towards uh, uh, the final manifestation. And uh, I, uh, in a three-week period, um, I identified four sites. Um, uh, on the non-cardinal points, these four in red here, uh, as possible sites for a group of four related, uh, uh, related structures, which also all have to be built within the, uh, 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 within the capabilities uh, and principle and, and constructive principles of the school. Uh, these are the, uh, and these are the four points. Uh, uh, and I numbered them five, six, seven, eight, uh, like that, and uh, came and proposed a series of four, of four structures, each of which were on uh, uh, either a five, a six, or a seven, or an eight-sided uh, base, so that the numbering of the base uh, reflected their, uh, uh, you know, that numbering up there. And each of those, uh, and I thought of them each as being structures that were um, uh, themselves differently made. This was the first drawing I made for a, uh, for a structure which has a kind of overlapping kind of uh, beams, st stone beams within it, which I then have subsequently rejected and produced another one. But the, uh, uh, so this, that's the seven-sided figure. The eight-sided figure um, I proposed using a, a uh, a simple stone, like the, uh, the masons are building the, the school out of. Uh, the six-sided figure I, I proposed uh, uh, using a, uh, uh, a broken stonework, uh, like a kind of crazy paving, uh, as a way of structuring the walls. Um, the five-sided figure I, used, uh, I proposed uh, um, using uh, round stones, like river stones, as a way of building. Uh, and these are all walls that I saw in Ladakh. Uh, and to substitute for the, uh, um, uh, the first idea, this kind of lattice work, uh, I thought of using a kind of herringbone. Uh, so these, uh, these would be the four, uh, the surfaces of the four uh, different um, uh, um, bases, uh, each of which employed a different vocabulary of, uh, uh, of stonework. And then... Uh, uh, and then I looked at a sculpture which was in the Tate Show, which is uh, which is actually called Lotus. Uh, and uh, uh, the, f the idea for um, uh, if I s both its name and the, uh, uh, and its uh, associations seem to fit very well with the school. So I pre and also uh, it's a sculpture that can exist in multiple or orientations. It kind of stand can stand in any uh, in any of several. Orientation. So the, the idea was we produce four versions of this, uh, which would uh, uh, which would stand on top of those bases. So this is the uh, this is the kind of uh, um, idea for uh, uh, for what's done. And then uh, uh, the subsequent work has been to do with trying to find uh, um, uh, a way of dividing a, a way of dividing that that up and to and make it buildable. Um, simplifying the form, uh, dividing it in two, um, uh, so that, we, so that uh, um, we either as a cast or carved form, uh, it can be made. We're still, it's still in process and we're, uh, we're getting there. And I've also, 
uh, at the same time uh, uh, began produced a uh, uh, there was a question of funding you know how how is a kind of school in uh, uh, Ladakh going to fund a, going to fund a work so that uh, um, uh, I, uh, I produced slightly slightly after this uh, a group of uh, in the first case prints so these are uh, these were prints um, uh, and there's three different ones, but the, uh, which I thought of as saleable items. Uh, but then uh, later we did some experiment. We found that we could print uh, onto silk, uh, and uh, just the, uh, and we printed just this blue element, uh, repeated uh, onto onto a silk, um, uh, a length of raw sil a length of white raw silk. So that as a, uh, as a fundraiser, uh, you weren't actually selling something. What you'd do is invite contributions. Uh, and then for, for those contributions, for, for over a certain amount, you'd, you'd make a gift. So that the, uh, would, and of, of one of these, uh, uh, one of these silk uh, uh, scarves or silk, silk um, um, prints, silk banners. So that, and that seemed to work much. That seemed to me to be a, a, a much more um, uh, appropriate fundraising mechanism. Uh, I don't know if it's worked. We won't find out for a while yet. But that's uh, um, um, uh, that's the project. Um, and uh, uh, this year we're, we'll be doing some. We've got the uh, the sculpture up to a point where we're looking at ways of building it. Uh, we haven't started the fundraising yet, um, but the, hopefully it will be made over the next two seasons, uh, and the four pieces will be in place by the end of uh, uh, 2016. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. This is what great men are made of. We are in the presence of somebody who is very special and we are thankful to you, Richard, for sharing your journey through this uh, retrospective at the Tate. And it was, in fact, many of us who have been to Tate many times must have felt nostalgic and felt the need that we should have been there to actually you know, feel the materials with which these are made. And what a, what a you know, significant you know, contribution of an artist in terms of how artists are so connected to the times they live in. They, they are thinking like a scientist, like a poet, like a musician, you know, like an intellectual and like a baby. The sense of wonder never stops. They, they are in a way very innocent, but with the innocence comes a deep empathy, understanding of the things around them. And this is what can make this world more beautiful, more livable. And they always create you know, opportunities for us to look at this world from a different point of view. Thank you so much, Richard. Can I ask you to take some questions, please? Request you. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, if, uh, um, uh, yes, OK. We can Anyone? take some questions. Or we could move to the? After five minutes of okay. questions. So we'll take some can... five minutes. And we out. I'll answer any questions or none, as the case may be. What is the name of the project? Uh, Lotus is still the working title. I haven't got a title for it yet. The school is the, uh, the White Lotus School. Uh, the school is called White Lotus. Yeah. And, and it's the Drakpa Trust, which is... Uh, um, which is organized both the building of the school uh, and is uh, uh, with whom I'm working for the, uh, uh, for the building, for the uh, executing the, the, the sculptures. Um, I was just going to ask, I was really interested in what you said um, when you were talking about the snake form with the stainless steel and yes. you spoke about either separation or conversation between the living and the dead. And I just wondered if you would expand just slightly. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> I think that um, um, in that Poussin painting, uh, 
I've always thought that the, the, the uh, I've always been interested in that combination of the stiff and the uh, uh, and the muscular, um, and uh, um, I also think that uh, um, in when I made work in wood um, and when I made work in steel, there was a difference. Um, and the, uh, the wood was, uh, uh, and I tended to make uh, work in wood which um, was more resonant, and whereas the work in steel was more reflective. Uh, and resonance uh, has, has to do with kind of conversation, whereas reflection seems to have to do with uh, um, self uh, um, um, uh, with um, uh, self enclosure or with uh, you know, with a kind of certain refusal or uh, um, the work the world doesn 't open to you if it 's reflecting it's uh, uh, it 's pushing you back on yourself so that the uh, so shininess and stiffness um, seem to be to be to do seems to me to have to do with uh, uh, solitariness and to some extent uh, not living. Although reflect, although the shimmer of reflection is also, as uh, Gert was pointing out, is also has a kind of certain joy to it. So there's you know it's a bit it's a bit ambiguous. I wouldn't say that. Uh, uh, Whereas um, uh, uh, the uh, enclosure or, uh, of, a, of the wooden things and the resonance uh, uh, is much more has much more to do with um, being engaged with the world and being absorbed by the world, uh, so that uh, it's uh, um, uh, living and dead is one thing or uh, uh, autistic and conversational would be an, would be would be another. I mean, I think mirrors are autistic, whereas guitars are conversational. It might be a kind of a, uh, way of putting it. You know. Any other question? Well, maybe narcissistic is rather than autistic, but I mean, it's a similar. Uh, there's a similar inability to absorb. From the outside. See, um, I'm forgetting the name of the sculptor who had also been influenced by Indian temple architecture, whose, whose separate annex is, I think, outside Santra Pampedu. What is that sculptor? Mm, very famous one. Bankuzi. So, uh, like you also uh, mentioned, Elora. And in which way do you, uh, is, it, is it something spiritual or is it basically the, the, uh, the way uh, artists or those architects or those saints who have, you know, built those gufas, like uh, architectural point of view or the material use, like in today's context, uh, when you get inspired by those things, how, how do you transform uh, the, the, you know, the centuries into the present day science fiction kind of a, Word. Um, my first sculptural experience was when I was six years old uh, in Sri Lanka, um, in Polonarua, uh, looking at the uh, the three rock carved Buddhas in <coughs> Polonarua. One standing, one seated, and one lying down. Uh, and it was clear to me they were made of the same stuff as the cliff. Uh, I could understand that. Uh, and I'm half the size I was now, I am now, so they looked quite large. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I couldn't understand what agency could have made them, you know, what, how, how on earth they could have come, uh, happened. Uh, so there was a kind of confusion in my mind between uh, the cliff that was taken away and the figure that was there. Uh, and, and it was as if I could see both things at the same time, the kind of absent cliff and the present, uh, uh, and the present figure. So that the, um, I experienced a negative space, if you like, but the, uh, um, uh, and so, uh, which I relate to 
Um, and I was terrified. I, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, an intellectual experience, it was an emotional experience, and I was uh, completely terrified by, by what I could see. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the emotional strength of that experience of, uh, of something, um, whether or not it's to do with uh, um, the... Like I say, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm no Buddhist. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but faith didn't seem to come into it. It was to, it was to do with the, uh, a manifestation of, some, uh, of something which I, couldn't, uh, which I couldn't identify, but which I s understood as being uh, the result of some sort of human agency. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, 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 that that kind of early experience. Um, uh, I think um, so. When I'm, when I talk about the the Kailash Temple, uh, it's also it's a kind of echo of that uh, of, uh, of that thing that's been churning over ever since I was seven years old about. What happens when you take thing, when you take something away? What do you leave? What do you leave behind?